This is by uh, Dr. Eric Grossman. Uh, Eric is a fellow in pediatric surgery at the uh, Lurie Children's Hospital here in Chicago. He, we like to claim him as a product of the University of Chicago since he was an undergraduate here, went to medical school here, did his residency here, including his, his uh, uh, surgical Ethics Fellowship, and, uh, and then we released him to go uh, elsewhere. But we're hoping someday that he will come back. Um, and we're happy today he's speaking on ethical issues in pediatric surgery. Eric. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a big honor to speak here. Thank you, Dr. Siegler, Dr. Angelos, and thank you, everyone, for sticking around for the last talk. I very much appreciate it. So. Um, when I initially thought about um, what I was going to talk about, I kind of left it broad, ethical issues in pediatric surgery, which kind of encompasses pretty much anything I wanted. And um, I wanted to basically focus on, um, on ECMO and uh, the ethics of ECMO. Um, you could probably speak for hours or even a whole weekend. Um, but in the next 10 minutes, what I was hoping to do is kind of give a quick, a quick um, introduction on what ECMO is. Uh, and then um, what I was hoping to do is kind of talk a little bit about how ECMO came about and the, the history of ECMO with a, a specific focus on the concept of equipoise. Um, equipoise being defined as um, um, the ethical standards, or excuse me, thinking about equipoise in the sense of ethical standards that were employed during the initiation of ECMO. And uh, now, um, when new um, treatment modalities are introduced, they're um, put upon such strict uh, criteria, uh, and I, I think it's really interesting to kind of see how ECMO came about. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is um, how ECMO, um, the ECMO experience in relationship to justice, um, specifically social justice and distributive ju justice, and how we ethically uh, distribute this resource, uh, who is eligible, who is not eligible, and um, who makes those decisions and how they are executed. And then finally, um, when you come off ECMO, obviously it's easy when a patient is doing well and you come off ECMO, but the question is when a child, or a specific relationship to children, when a child is not doing well, and the decision to come off ECMO has to be made, um, how that kind of spans the, um, the realm between autonomy and uh, futility. So quickly, an introduction. So ECMO stands for um, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Um, it's used as support for patients with uh, reversible pulmonary and or cardiac failure uh, and whom maximal conventional therapies have failed. I put two pictures up here, though. Cartoon is, if you Google ECMO, this is one of the pictures you'll get, and it's very benign looking um, and peaceful. Um, this was the most graphic photograph I found on Google um, that was not too graphic. Um, ECMO is by far uh, a far stretch from benign. It's extremely invasive and uh, comes at a, a large uh, risk. And, and I, I put those two pictures up just because I think it's important for us to understand that what patients perceive and what they are about to go through, what their child is about to go through, um, it's almost impossible. I mean, there's really no way a parent could have appreciate what their child is about to go through uh, when they elect to put their kid on ECMO. Um, so Dr. Lantos, who I had the good fortune of, uh, when I was an ethics fellow, uh, hearing him speak, um, phrases it as such. Uh, ECMO is um, less a discrete intervention than a commitment by a large group of skilled individuals to provide ongoing, high-risk, high-tech life support at an extraordinary cost of time, energy, equipment, and money. And I, I think this really sums it up best. Um, it is an enormous intervention, about as big as we could do for a child. Um, and it is a costly both in um, uh, resources, uh, medical professionals, uh, family buy-in, um, and then risk to the patient. And, and what's especially interesting with ECMO is that it's, it's someone else who's go undergoing the risk. As the parent, you, um, you purchase this for your child. And I, I use the word purchase only in the sense of buying in. Uh, I mean, it's a, a big commitment to put someone through. Um, so the final thing I wanted to say as far as an introduction is what, what are we offering with ECMO? I mean, the whole point of going on ECMO is you're likely to die without it. So what are we offering you? What are your chances of surviving? So this is from uh, the ELSO database, which is the organization that compiles all of um, the ECMO data. Uh, and it's a little bit, um, it is what it is, but these are the um, uh, total values. So uh, the cumulative data, so if you just kind of look at um, 
surviving to discharge or surviving to transfer under the neonatal and the pediatric. Uh, and then if you look at either respiratory or cardiac, um, eCPR is just simply um, um, crashing onto ECMO, and those numbers are obviously lower. But the surviving to discharge or surviving to transfer ranges between 49 and 75 percent. That 75 percent, in my opinion, is a um, uh, so a um, misleading number because that is a product of uh, the fact that neonatologists have become so good at treating um, um, a corneum aspiration such that um, only the sickest go on ECMO. Um, that number I think will change as less and less um, uh, as neonatologists get better and better at treating uh, respiratory problems, so fewer and fewer kids require ECMO for respiratory problems, and the vast majority of kids who go on ECMO are diaphragmatic hernias or kids with um, really just um, uh, unusual problems. So the first topic I wanted to talk about was equipoise. So obviously there's lots of definitions. The definition I wanted to kind of focus on was um, genuine uncertainty uh, in the expert medical community over whether a treatment will be beneficial. And then so kind of uh, what were the ethical standards that, um, that the surgical community used when ethics, excuse me, when uh, ECMO was introduced. So uh, this is Dr. Bob Bartlett from the University of Michigan. Uh, so 1975 was the uh, first successful application of ECMO in the neonatal respiratory failure. And this was, um, this was his publication. Uh, extra, uh, extracorporeal circulation in neonatal respiratory failure, a prospective randomized study. So what did the um, randomization uh, allocation entail? What it was, was it was 12 children, uh, and it was uh, classified as what's called a play the winner, such that the uh, first child was placed on a conventional ventilator and died. Uh, the next one was placed on ECMO and lived, and the way the study was designed that you were placed on you were randomized to whatever the benefit was from the previous one. So in other words, as ECMO did better, more and more kids went on ECMO. So of these 12 kids, patients, uh, one was uh, conventionally ventilated, the following 11 were all placed on ECMO, and they all survived. So this was the beginning of um, our randomized studies in ECMO. Uh, this was followed up uh, in 1989. Um, uh, by Dr. O'Rourke, uh, looking at um, extra uh, ECMO in neonates with persistent pulmonary hypertension, another prospective randomized study. And this was uh, not as um, skewed as the play the winner. This is what's called an adaptive patient allocation, in which there was a, a randomized section and then a second section. So in the first trial, there was a four, excuse me, ten patients, four of whom, uh, four of whom died in the conventional ventilation, and uh, nine of whom all survived in the ECMO. And the second set, everyone went on ECMO, and 19 of the 20 survived. So um, again, not exactly what we would call a randomized controlled study, but um, I bring it up just simply to kind of go through how ECMO came about. Um, the counterpoint to this, um, also published in 1989, uh, was a um, uh, paper published uh, saying um, survival of infants with persistent pulmonary hypertension. So these are the majority of kids going on ECMO at the time, this plus meconium aspiration. And what they did um, is they basically looked at their results um, and compared them with the results of kids who would have qualified for ECMO. And they said, hey, you know, we're, we're doing better with our ventilation. Obviously, 1989 is not the way we ventilate children now, but there were benefits. And they said, hey, we're, ben we're ventilating kids better. Our survival is just as good as ECMO survival. We propose that a better randomized clinical trial should be undertaken before ECMO, before further expenditures on ECMO centers are made. So this was um, kind of a point counterpoint, um, beginning to think about how equipoise was, um, was uh, executed. Nonetheless, um, ECMO came and really exploded. So this is looking at uh, 1985 to 1990, um, the ECMO registry as well as neonatal ECMO, ECMO centers. This is out of the University of Michigan, which really um, is the birth of ECMO. And as you can see, the numbers just shot up exponentially um, uh, over, the, over that 10-year uh, period. Um, so, in retrospect, where are we? So this is a Cochrane, um, uh, Cochrane review from 2008 that basically tried to say, you know, ECMO is here, um, the survival is what it is. How confident are we that there are randomized data to say ECMO is actually benefits to our patients? So 
there have basically been four randomized controlled studies um, that this Cochrane review looked at. Um, to compare ECMO, this is all in children, to conventional ventilation. And their conclusions was that a policy of using ECMO in mature infants uh, with severe but potentially reversible respiratory failure results in significant improval of survival without increased risk of severe disability. So um, whether or not it was executed or initiated with equipoise, uh, this Cochrane review definitely would support um, the data, excuse me, the data would support its use uh, for children. However, the benefit of ECMO for babies with diaphragmatic hernias remains unclear. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, as neonatal Technology improves, the majority of our children, uh, or a larger percentage of them, and I'll show you the data in a minute, are diaphragmatic hernias, um, no more than meconium aspirations or the primary pulmonary hypertension. And whether or not the data supports this, I think, is, um, is unknown. So changing gears a little bit, um, justice and the, the definition of um, distributive justice. So how, ju how goods are socially allocated in a society. Um, this, is the, this is the version of Plato's Republic that I read uh, like almost 20 years ago as a freshman in college. Um, and I loved it. And I loved thinking about the concept of how to distribute goods in a society and, and who gets what and upon what merits do they get those goods? Um, and, and I think it's just such an interesting way to think about medicine and how we, who gets what treatment, who comes to the University of Chicago, who doesn't come, and then when they are there, uh, how are they treated? Um, and ECMO is, ECMO is one of the most exclusive things we have, I and mean, you have to qualify. Um, and so the way that we decide who gets or who is even eligible for ECMO. So there's a, a few different criteria. So ELSO, who's the, um, um, as I mentioned earlier, they compile all the data and they credential ECMO centers, have specific center inclusion or exclusion criteria. Additionally, specific hospitals also have um, their own inclusion or exclusion criteria. And I just listed them here, not because I think they're wrong, but I think it's really interesting. Um, so you have to be more than 34 weeks gestational age. You have to weigh more than either 1.7, 2.0, or 2.5, um, I should say kilograms. And, and the variability is there, uh, I highlight that just simply because that's center to center to center. Um, across the street where I'm at right now at Lori Children's, we are at 2.0. So you have to weigh more than two kilos to get on ECMO. Um, and even that number is slightly fudgeable, but um, that's different from every center, and, and I, I think that's um, it's a very interesting thing that it's a, um, a different number. You have to have what's called reversible lung disease. The concept of reversible lung disease is as ambiguous as it sounds, um, and it's very hard on who decides what reversible lung disease is and whether your lung disease is reversible. You can't be ventilated prior to ECMO for more than seven or more than 10 or more than 14 days. All of these things kind of add to the ambiguity on whether or not you're a candidate. The bleeding and the coagulability is, the coagulopathy is kind of self-evident because of the heparin. And then lethal condition incompatible with life, including trisomy 13 and trisomy 18. I put that there, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, interestingly, this is Aetna, the insurance company's um, uh, criteria for who goes on ECMO. Uh, you got to be more than 34 weeks and you have to weigh more than two kilos. Uh, and if you don't, they say this, um, ECMO, excuse me, Aetna considers ECMO for neonates experimental and investigational if you don't meet these criteria. I don't know if this means they won't pay for it, I doubt that, but it's, um, it's, it's definitely on their website. And this I stole from the internet as well. So these are um, pictures on trisomy 18 and trisomy 13 support group websites. So these are people who are excluded from ECMO. Um, um, I was reminded of um, when I did my uh, ethics fellowship, Dr. Dr. Replogle would talk all about how uh, children with Down syndrome were treated when he was training. Um, obviously the outcome for 18 and 13 is much worse than Down syndrome, but these are children who are excluded from ECMO, and these are their pictures and their support groups, and they are definitely, um, some of them live longer than we would anticipate. The final thing I want to say about justice in the sense of how is ECMO distributed, this is a chart, excuse me, this is a graph looking at who goes on ECMO. I just want to highlight the blue and the black. So the blue is white population, um, 
uh, and then how often whites go on ECMO, and then black both dotted and in a bar is the African American population as a percentage of the census as well as a percentage of how often they go on ECMO. And basically neonates of ethnic minorities continue to disproportion disproportionately require ECMO in comparison to their birth rates. Uh, it's argued that maybe um, ethnic minorities get worse care prior to coming to tertiary centers and therefore require ECMO more. Uh, I'm not sure what this means, but it's definitely different as far as what you would expect simply from a numbers game. And then finally, coming off ECMO. So this is an article from the New England Journal by Dr. Siegler and Dr. Satter, who are still here. Um, talking about how to come off ECMO and what to do when you're coming off ECMO and you know it's not going to end well and the patient doesn't want to um, and the family doesn't want to. Um, and so does patient autonomy require medical professionals to comply with family requests and how does that differ in the withdrawal of support? So the two, um, uh, what, what, what Dr. Siegler referenced was the Healthcare Decision Act of Virginia. Uh, in which a physician shall not be construed to prescribe or render medical treatment to a patient that they determine to be medically or ethically inappropriate, as well as the Brody versus New England Sinai Hospital in 86, in which a hospital and its staff should not be compelled to act contrary to their moral or ethical principles. And what this sounding board proposed was that if you think it's time and you think it's ethically appropriate, then to decannulate despite the um, disappointment of the family. So in conclusion, I think we kind of talked a little bit about how equipoise was used as the ECMO came about, the justice of how ECMO was distributed, and the issues of autonomy and futility on how we come off ECMO. Again, thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you very much. That was great.